Thanks so much for coming to a tax seminar. And I wouldn't say necessarily that this is just an exciting moment in your lives right up to tax season. Hearing about income tax can be fun all year round. <laughs> now this session focuses primarily on G4 visa holders. However, there, there are many times I'm going to mention the tax residency statutes and the effect on green card holders. So th those green card holders that remain here all the way out th throughout the seminar still may have some questions. I'll be happy to take those at the end of the seminar. So let's, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about tax residency, the basics. Then we're going to move on to taxation of non-residents. And primarily, most of you here probably are non-resident taxpayers. Next, we'll go on to the dreaded tax returns that may or may not have to be filled out. And finally, we'll, we'll go over some other important tax information, including the taxation of real estate to non-residents. Now, today we're here to talk about income taxation of non-residents. We're not here to talk about estate taxation of non-residents. That's for a later seminar. And I understand in March there will be another seminar for estate and gift taxation of non-residents. Today we're going to talk about the U.S. income tax law as it pertains to U.S. non-residents. But again, income tax. Here is a dis disclaimer. Now, you would think, why does Dale need a disclaimer? The reason is that there are four million or more words in the income tax code. Four million or more. It's longer than the Bible and it changes every so often. It changes a lot. There's something like hundreds and hundreds of general changes every year that takes place. They're currently talking about tax simplification in Congress and I can't wait for tax simplification because the last time tax simplification happened was in 1986 I was two years out of school working for Arthur Anderson. Many of you may remember that uh, company's name. Uh, I got out of there just in time. Um, and the tax simplification of 1986 came into effect. And guess what? It became more and more complicated. Why? Because they did a phase in of tax simplification. And by the, by the time they got done with the phase in of tax simplification, Congress started adding more and more laws to make it more and more complex. So the law never did become com uh, simple, and it never will be, I don't think. So let's talk about tax residency. Many of you here, the G4 visa holders, are probably thinking to yourself, well, I'm a G4 visa holder, so I am not a tax resident of the United States. Well, that might be so. You may be a non-resident of the United States, but the question is why? And I'll give you a hint, it's not because you hold G4 status. Uh, already some of you are sitting on the edge of your seats trying to find out why. What is the relevancy of U.S. tax residency? Well, if you are a U.S. tax resident, you're subject to income tax on a worldwide basis. In other words, if you earn money or earn anything outside the United States and you are a U.S. tax resident, you have to report that income and provide the U.S. government with a lot of information reports on a U.S. income tax return. If you are a non-resident, there are only certain types of income that are subject to U.S. tax. And that would be called U.S. source type income, U.S. source income. And we'll be getting to the types of income that are subject to U.S. tax for non-residents. Now, U.S. citizens such as myself are subject to tax, as I was saying, on a worldwide basis, no matter where we live. As a matter of fact, we can live outside the United States all of our lives and we'll still be subject to U.S. income taxation. Isn't that fun? As a matter of fact, there's only two countries in the whole world that tax based on citizenship. One, of course, is the United States, and number two is Eritrea. <laughs> Go figure why Eritrea. But just the U.S. and uh, Eritrea tax based on citizenship. Typically, all the other countries in the world tax based on where you're located. If you're located in the country, you're taxed as a resident, subject to tax on worldwide income. If you leave the country, and come to the U.S., for example, most of you G4s had, you had a home country, you were subject to tax in that home country, then you came to the U.S. 
And once you came to the U.S., you also cons you, you stayed a non-resident, which we'll go over in a moment. I want to make it clear that you can be a non-resident everywhere in the world. There's no worldwide government, and so you can be a non-resident in your home country and a non-resident in the United States. But so U.S. citizens are always subject to U.S. taxation. Now, U.S. lawful permanent residents, if you ever decide to get a green card, you're also subject to tax on a worldwide basis and information reporting. 99.99% of the time. There's only a very, very few people who are not subject to U.S. tax. And those people typically take treated tiebreaker positions. If you want to, if you can't sleep one night and you want to Google that, treaty tiebreaker position, you can Google it and that will make sure you fall asleep real quickly, okay? <laughs> the final thing which should be important to you G4 visa holders is called the substantial presence test of residency. Let me first talk about when you become a green card holder and when tax residency begins. So it's the first day that you're in the United States with a valid green card is when you are a tax resident of the U.S. Get a green card, are here, the first day you become a tax resident and you're a tax resident from then on there as long as you hold your green card. Now substantial presence test for UG4 visa holders, this may be a way where you will become a U.S. tax resident. It may be that you will become a U.S. tax resident under the so-called substantial presence test. The key number is 183 days of physical presence, but it's only countable days. So if your days are count countable while you're in the United States, once you reach the magic number of 183, you will become a tax resident of the U.S. How do we calculate it? The U.S. always loves formulas. So the formula is you, you count all the days of physical presence in the United States. These are going to be countable days, which I'll go over in a second. Countable days of physical presence in the United States plus one-third of the days of presence in the prior year plus one-sixth of the countable days of presence in the year before that. You add them all up. And if you, are, if you get to the number 183 or more, you will become a U.S. tax resident. Now remember, there's always the general rule, then there's the exceptions, and then sometimes, and most often, there's the exception to the exception. So be very careful, um, and I wanted to make sure that everyone, if you don't know what the answer is, you're absolutely right, you should not contact the, the Internal Revenue Service. Now that doesn't make any sense, right? Why is that? Well, the, United, the Internal Revenue Service, just this, this month, last month actually, they came out and they said, if people try to call us, first of all, we're, we're under budget constraints. And so we've had to reduce the training budget for IRS agents 83% since 2010. But besides that, if you try to call us, only 50% of the time will you get through and the average wait time will be longer than 30 minutes on the phone. And they will only answer basic tax questions if they can up until April 15th. After April 15th, they've said, we will not answer any tax questions. If you extend your tax return, we will not answer any questions after April 15th. So the IRS is not the place to go, unfortunately, for income tax information. Their publications are good. And if you can stand reading all the way through them, and of course there's always the Internal Revenue Code, regulations, but pretty much you should seek help from a professional tax advisor. Not that I don't say that because I am one, but I think that's just a good recommendation anyway. Okay, so when I talked about countable days, here is the key for you G4 visa holders. Full-time employment with an international or organization, such as the World Bank, causes U.S. days not to be counted for purposes of the substantial presence test. So, if you are a full-time employee or, as you see here, a dependent of a full-time employee, as most of you are here at the Family Network, a dependent of a full-time employee at the World Bank, your days also are not counted for purposes of the substantial presence test. It's like you're not even here. So for tax purposes, since it's like, like you're not even here, you are considered a non-resident 
of the U.S. because you're not here and your days don't count. The key is you have to be a full-time employee of an international organization. doesn't say anything about G4s in the entire Internal Revenue Code of Regulations. It's a full-time employee of an international organization that will make your days not count. And so if your spouse works for the World Bank, the IMF, or other international organizations, they don't, their days don't count, and any spouses or their dependents who are not married under the age of 21, their days also will not count for purposes of the substantial presence test. So typically, G4 visa holders, their spouses, and their dependents living at home, they'll all will be non-resident of the United States. So, US citizens. U.S. citizens are always subject to tax on a worldwide basis. Now, there's, there's two things that you have to consider here. There's always, there's two things. The first is whether or not you're a tax resident, <coughs> which we just went over. The second thing is whether or not your wages are subject to taxation. Whether you're a resident or non-resident, as long as you're a non-citizen of the U.S., your wages from the World Bank will not be considered taxable. So you could be a resident of the United States, but wages will never be taxable to a non-citizen of the U.S. So, non-resident income taxation. There's two types of income that we'll be talking about today that is potentially subject to tax to non-residents. The first one is called effectively connected income. That would be income where you're actually working in the United States. Now, we just went over the fact that G4 visa holders, your wages are exempt if you work for the international organization, but their spouse's wages would not be exempt if they work outside of an international organization. So maybe many of you here, your G4 dependents, and you work outside of an international organization. You don't work for the World Bank or the IMF or any of the other ones. Instead, you work for a private company. Now, you will remain non-resident because of the substantial presence test we just went over, but your wages will be considered effectively connected income because you're working at not an international organization, a private company, and so your wages are subject to tax as effectively connected income. Typically, that effectively connected income, those wages, would be subject to tax at progressive rates. Now, the U.S. tax system used to be considered a tax haven because it, people around the world, especially from Europe, thought that our income tax rates were fairly low. But in the last few years, they've gone up quite a bit, and they're, they're approaching 40% nowadays. So it's, it's really 39.6% is the highest marginal rate, 39.6%. Another crazy complexity they, they've added. Uh, why don't they just make it 40, right? Um, and then the other type of income, which we'll go, go into more detail on, is income that's not effectively connected with the United States uh, bit, trader business. What this is, this is investment income. There's certain types of investment income that you'll be subject to tax to as a non-resident. Now, non-effectively connected income, as you'll see in a couple of moments, is taxed at a 30% tax rate. So, for example, U.S. source dividends, dividends from U.S. companies, is going to be subject to tax at a 30% tax rate. That would be non-effectively connected income. That's investment type income that's subject to tax. And you can't offset the non-effectively connected income with any deductions whatsoever. Now, let me talk about the WABEN. Who ever remembers the great form WABEN? Yes, a few of you remember the form. If you have an account with uh, Bank Fund Staff Federal, Federal Credit Union, or if you have an account with any U.S. financial institution, you should have been given one of two forms to fill out. Either the WABEN, which is for non-residents, or the W-9 form, excuse me, which is for citizens and residents. Now, if you have gone to the Bank Fund Staff Federal Credit Union, they know all about international organization employees. So they would have handed you, probably once you said you were a G-4, they would probably would have handed you a W-A-B-E-N, and you, you would have done everything correctly. But if you go to another financial institution, Schwab, TD Ameritrade, Smith Barney, 
they don't know about international organization employees. And if you tell them, if you tell your broker over the phone or in person, I've lived here years and years, they're going to automatically think that you're a resident and they're going to give you a form W-9 to fill out. If you filled out the W-9 and you are a non-resident, that was the wrong form to fill out. Are there penalties? No. But there are kind of penalties in the fact that you'll be getting the wrong tax forms and then the IRS may send notices to you telling you have a tax filing requirement when maybe you don't. Or if you fill out a W-9, they won't do, the brokerage firm won't do the proper income tax withholding from you and that means you'll probably have to fill out a tax return. So just know, how do you know whether or not you filled out the correct form? If you get, if you're a non-resident and you get in the mail from the financial institution a form 1099, that's the wrong form. You should be getting on any income, that, any investment income that you receive from banks or financial institutions or credit unions, you should be receiving a form 1042S. If you get a 1042S, you know you filled out the right form, the W-A-B-E-N. Now, you know, tax can be very complicated and so can uh, junk mail. It's just uh, so much junk mail people get, they tend to just throw things away. So it may be that you filled out the W-A-B-E-N correctly, except that three years has exp uh, transpired and your W-A-B-E-N expired. So that they send you notices and they send you notices saying, please fill out another W-A-B-E-N, your W-A-B-E-N expired. And if you don't fill out another W-A-B-E-N, the financial institution will start withholding 28% 28 tax on the income that you earned at the financial institution as what's called back of withholding. That's another way to know you filled out the wrong form. So all you have to do is contact your financial institution and tell them, oops, I, I think I filled out the wrong form. Fill it in a, another W-A-B-E-N B -E -N, and give them that form. Okay, interest in income. Just um, in 2013 was the first time U.S. financial institutions had to provide their clients who were non-residents with a tax form from earnings from interest income, interest income earnings. It used to be that non-residents could invest in any U.S. financial institution and as long as they earned portfolio interest or bank interest, that income was tax-free and there was no reporting whatsoever. Even to their home country, remember, 99.9% of non-residents live outside the United States, not in. So it used to be viewed kind of the U.S. as a tax haven. People, let's say, from the U.K. and other countries would put money in the U.S. financial institutions, earn interest income, and then that would never be reported to their home country government. And so uh, you could get away with not paying tax in the U.S. because it's tax-free, and also get away with not paying tax in the home country if you were actually live and work in that home country and are a tax resident of that home country. So finally, the political pressure was too much for the IRS and for Congress. So they decided in 2013 to require financial institutions to report interest income to non-residents. It's still tax-free and you still don't have to pay any tax on the interest earned from the credit union or any other bank or financial institution, but you will get a form in the mail, the 1042S, and that 1042S will report to you the amount of interest that you earn, but there should be an indication on the form that it's tax-free interest income. So don't worry about that. Don't worry. You don't have to file a tax return just because you get this form in the mail. How many of you have gotten 1042S this year so far? Okay, quite a few. All right, now probably the biggest, um, uh, biggest income that I see in practice that's taxable to non-residents is dividend income from U.S. corporations. So let me help you with a little bit of tax planning here. If you are a non-resident and you invest in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, etc., well, there's a couple of ways to have tax-free income. The first, for U.S. purposes, the first one is to invest in bonds. 
treasury bonds, corporate bonds, all of that interest, again, is tax-free to non-residents, not to U.S. citizens, not to green card holders, but to non-residents. That interest income is tax-free. What's not tax-free is if you invest in U.S. corporations and receive a dividend from those U.S. corporations, that's subject to tax at a 30% tax rate. Another hint about the form W-8-B-E-N. The W-8-B-E-N has an indication, you can make, put an indication in the middle of the form, I can't remember, I think it might be part two, that asks you whether you're a resident of another country. Now you're only a resident of another country if you pay tax to that country on a full worldwide basis. So most of you G4s, as I explained earlier, are no longer a resident in your home country. So don't fill out that portion. Some people do it incorrectly and they think, well, I'm a citizen of the UK or wherever. And they put UK on that line. And then they're, sometimes they or the financial institution put the reduced withholding rate of 15%. But since you're not a tax resident of your home country, you're not supposed to pay the reduced, uh, with, uh, reduced tax of potentially 15% on U.S. source dividends, so you're supposed to pay the full 30% tax. So if you've only been withheld by the financial institution on U.S. source dividends at a 15% tax rate, you have to file a tax return and pay the additional 15% to make sure that your tax return is right. Now the US government audits tax returns, but it's everybody's responsibility to make sure that they've correctly complied with the US tax law. So uh, it's, you sign the, the form under penalties of perjury. So if you've underreported or you've had under withholding because of US dividends or anything else, you have to file a tax return and pay the additional amount of tax to the US government. Okay, so this is this uh, tax on capital gains I'm going to go into next. Now this is something that hardly anybody knows about, except the U.S. government knows about it because it's clearly right on their website. Capital gains from the sale of personal property, such as stocks, bonds, mutual funds. If you sell a stock, bond, or mutual <coughs> fund at a gain, that is considered a capital gain, whether it's short-term, less than a year, or long-term, over a year. The rule is that generally, non-residents are not subject to any tax on capital gains, <coughs> even if it's U.S. government, even if it's U.S. source capital gains. I mean, in, in other words, even if it's capital gains from the sale of a U.S. security, non-residents are usually not subject to any tax on those capital gains. However, there's a special rule that primarily hits international organization employees and students. What is that rule? That rule is if you're physically present in the United States and you work and live in the United States, in other words your tax home is here, and you sell stocks, bonds, mutual funds anywhere in the world, as long as you're here 183 days or more in the calendar year physically present here, you're subject to worldwide capital gains tax and you have to pay 30% of that gain to the US government. What? <laughs> yes, it's true. And it's, um, it's a very little known law among international organization employees. So you need to take a look, even if you have brokerage accounts outside the United States, and you make a sale of stocks, bonds, mutual funds, personal property at a capital gain, but you're physically present here 183 days or more, and that rule regarding your days don't count, that doesn't apply for this particular rule. This rule on capital gains is physically present here 183 days or more, sell, sale of stock anywhere in the world, and you're subject to capital gains tax at 30%. Now, the good news, if there, if there is any, is that losses of the, from the sale of personal property can offset the gains. So if you go along during the year and you have gains on the sale of your um, stocks or bonds or what have you, uh, then 
at the end of the year, you should decide if you have any lost securities in your account, you can sell those securities and that will offset the gains and you only have to pay tax only. 30% tax on the net capital gains that you have from the sale of securities. <coughs> okay, so let's talk now about the fabulous tax return. Again, if and only if you are a non-resident, and we'll go into what's called the 6013G election in a moment regarding filing a joint tax return with your spouse, but suffice it to say, to say, if you're here in this room and you're a G4 visa holder and you're married to a G4 visa holder, then if you have two G4 visa holders that are married, you cannot file a joint income tax return you can't make yourself resident, and you can't file a Form 1040. If you're a non-resident and you're a G4 visa holder, you have to fill out, in that example that I just gave, a 1040 non-resident return. If you're, married to, if you're a G4 visa holder and you're married to a U.S. citizen or resident of the U.S., a green card holder, then you can file jointly, but you have to make a special election, which I'll go into um, next. If you file the 1040 NR, people say, Dale, it's unfair. There, I, we have a home mortgage, we have property taxes, and my spouse's earnings are taxable because she works for outside an international organization. Why shouldn't we be able to take a deduction for interest on our mortgage and property taxes. Again, Congress just decided that, and the reason they decided that, again, was that most people's home that, who are non-residents are located outside the United States, and the, and the government didn't want to give a deduction for people's houses that, that live outside the U.S. So, you G4 visa holders um, that can't file a joint tax return, you have to file a non-resident return, and if you're if you're working outside, and outside for a non-international organization, your wages are taxable, but you can't take a deduction for home mortgage interest or property taxes, unfortunately. Now, who can file a joint income tax return? Who can file a joint income tax return? Only those people here who are married, if they're a G4 visa holder, they have to be married to a U.S. citizen, a green card holder, or other U.S. resident in order to be able to file a joint income tax return. And then, perhaps they can write off the home mortgage interest and property taxes as a deduction because then you can fill out the Form 1040. But to file a joint income tax return, the law requires that you make a special election. Now, it's not on a tax form, it's simply a white paper, you just Take a piece of paper and you write, this is a 6013G election. You hereby elect for your non-resident spouse to be a resident of the United States. Because you see, only two tax residents can file a joint income tax return. Two non-residents can't file a joint tax return, so you have to have one person be a resident, one person be a non-resident, then you can make the election for the U.S. citizen or other resident to make the election for the non-resident to be a resident to file a joint tax return. And if you haven't made that election, you need to do so. There are many people who file jointly who just never know that, know that, that rule. But I will, during the question and answer period, I will tell you what the secret is to solving that potential um, issue that you may have. So again, stay on the edge of your seats. Okay, the filing, the tax return filing due date of a non-resident. Here we go into the general rule and the exceptions to the rule. So the general rule is that non-residents have a tax filing date of June 15th. Not April 15th, June 15th. The problem with that is that all the states around here, Virginia, Maryland, and D.C., don't have a special filing date for non-residents of June 15th. 
And so you might as well go ahead and file your tax return if you have a tax filing requirement on April 15th and not wait until June 15th. Now, the other, the other exception to the general rule where non-residents file on June 15th is that if you are a spouse that has wages uh, that are subject to income tax withholding, and you would have wages subject to income tax withholding if you're a G4 dependent, say, working for an outside organization, not an international organization, then you earn wages and it's subject to income tax withholding. So the exception for that is that you then do have a tax filing requirement on April 15th. The bottom line is, if you have a tax filing requirement, file by April 15th. So the question often comes up, you know, if I earn income from an international organization, I'm a G4 visa holder, do I have a tax filing requirement? And let's say I only earn tax-free interest income, I only have money in the credit union, so I earn tax-free interest income, and my income from the international organization is tax-exempt, do I have a tax filing requirement? Whew. Thank goodness the answer is no, you don't have a tax filing requirement. Now that I said it, many of you who have that situation will probably just fall asleep because you don't need to know anything else. All right, we can't go into questions, as I mentioned before. We're going to hold those until the end. Now, many or most of you have a U.S. Uh, residence. You have real estate here in the United States. And the question is, what are the tax implications, implications uh, when you sell that real estate? You may have a principal residence or you may have a rental property. If you do have a rental property that's located in the U.S. and you're a non-resident, well that is U.S. income. That's derived from a U.S. source, so you have to pay U.S. income tax on that rental income that you receive on that U.S. rental property. What many people forget to do, if they try to do it themselves, is they report the rental income, but they forget to take what's called a depreciation allowance. The depreciation allowance is allowed on the building portion of the real estate, and you're allowed a 27 and a half year life. So basically, you look at your property tax statement on your rental property, you look at the, um, um, the when you first purchase the property, you look at the building portion of the property, and the building portion is the amount that you're able to depreciate over a 27 and a half year period. So you get a deduction for it every year against the rental income that you earn. But you say, Dale, why should I report if I have a loss? I'm sorry that you have a loss, but you have to report because that's the law. But it's a good thing to report your loss. And the reason for that is if you have a, a loss on your rental property, you get to carry it over. And if you have the loss the next year, you get to carry it over again. And when finally you sell the property, you can offset that loss against any gain from the sale of your rental property. So it's always good, besides the fact that it's the law, it's always good to report your income from any rental property that you have located in the U.S. You don't have to, if you're a non-resident, you don't have to report to the U.S. government um, any rental property that you have outside the U.S. And we're going to go into more detail, but you always have to watch out when you sell any property in the U.S. What you have to watch out for what's called FERPTA tax withholding, the Foreign Investment and in Real Property Tax Act, FERPTA. FERPTA 10% withholding, it's a withholding tax on any sale of U.S. property by a non-resident. But we'll go into more detail of that in a moment. So what happens if you sell your principal residence? Will you be taxed on the gain if you're a non-resident or even if you're a resident? The answer is, of course, in the U.S. tax law, it depends. So here's what it depends on. It depends uh, because there's an exclusion of gain available to anyone in the United States that has a U.S. principal residence, okay? Anyone that has a U.S. principal residence, 
you can s exclude $250,000 on the gain from the sale of that residence if you're single, and $500,000 on the gain from the sale of that principal residence if you're married. So that's quite a big tax break that you have on, your, on the sale of a principal residence. Now what do you have to, what tests do you have to comply with in order to meet the requirements for being a personal residence and for this exclusion? You have to, as it says here, it has to be your principal residence and you have to have it as that principal residence, you have to live in it for at least two years out of the previous five years before you make the sale. So you have to live in it at least two out of the last five years prior to the time that you make the sale. Which means that if you decide to decide, oh, I'm going to go back to my home country, I'll rent it out for a while. You've complied with the law of it being your principal residence for two years up to that point, and then you move abroad and you rent it out. If you rent it out, you think about it, for three years and one day, then if you sell it after that three years and one day, you won't have met the requirement of it being your principal residence two out of the last five years. So just be careful when you decide to sell your, your principal residence when you decide to sell it. Watch out for this five year period. So you, in order to get this gain exclusion from the sale. So let's talk about um, FERPTA withholding, the Foreign Investment and Real Property Tax Act. Now, because again, most non-residents live outside the U.S., the U.S. Congress was concerned that if they sold real property in the U.S., they would somehow not pay the U.S. government because they would be living outside the U.S. And how would the U.S. government get their rightful share of the tax without sending in troops? <laughs> so they decided to put this law into place, which is a 10% withholding of the gross sales proceeds of any property regardless if you have a gain or loss or anything on the sale of real property in the United States. So if you're a G4 visa holder and you have a rental property and you sell it, if you just are a G4 visa holder and you sell your principal residence, it's going to be subject to 10% FERPTA withholding on the gross sales proceeds. Now that's a withholding tax, that's not a final tax. So that if you meet all the requirements of the from the sale of the principal residence, the exclusion of the gain, then you won't have to pay any tax, but you still will have to up front pay this 10% withholding tax that the settlement agent will take from you at the settlement table. So we've had many people call us, help, I just sold my million dollar property, I'm a non-resident, I filled out the WABEN like I'm supposed to, and the settlement agent took $100,000 from me at the settlement table. They say, yes, that's what they're supposed to do. You should have come to a family network seminar. <laughs> so what do you do about it? Um, let me go over first. There's just a, a couple of exceptions from the FERPTA withholding. Uh, if you sell a property, and there's not too many properties in the D.C. area that would sell for less than $300,000, but if it's not more than $300,000, if you sell that property, there is no FERPTA withholding. I probably shouldn't have the second bullet point because it just says that if you give them a form W-9, which indicates that you're a U.S. resident or a citizen, which you shouldn't do if you're a non-resident, if you give them that form, then they won't withhold. But again, you're filling out the statement under penalties of perjury, so only U.S. citizens and green card holders can rightfully fill out the form W-9 saying that they are a, a, uh, a resident um, or a citizen of the U.S. So again, if you're a non-resident, you need to fill out the WABEN. The third option, and this can be quite helpful, the third option is a form 8288B. It's called a withholding certificate. Okay, a withholding certificate. So, you sold the property, the settlement agent and you one of two forms, you WABEN, W9, you fill out the rightful WABEN, you're a non-resident. 
They say, we are going to withhold $100,000 from you. And you think, oh, this is not good, this is not good. It's only February. It's only February and, okay, maybe I don't have to pay, maybe I shouldn't have to pay any tax on this sale, but I don't want my $100,000 withheld from me. I don't want that 10% withholding. I'm not going to get it back until I file a tax return for the year, which is like a full year from now. So what else can you do? Well, Congress decided that there would be one other way to get your withholding back, and that would be to fill out the Form 8288B. It's used to apply for a withholding certificate. To, it, 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 I should say it is a withholding certificate, um, and it, it enables the taxpayer to get their funds back earlier than having to file a tax return. Now the 8288B is more complicated than filling out a tax return, but many of you will not, again, want to wait till you fill out the tax return to get your refund back. Because you see, if they take the withholding amount, that 10%, they'll immediately pass it over to the Internal Revenue Service and they will give you a form that shows that they gave it over to the Internal Revenue Service. And then you have to wait to file the tax return for that year to get any of your money back. So if you truly don't have any tax from the sale of your principal residence because of the exclusion of gain I mentioned, then, but you still have to wait till the tax return or you can fill out this 8288B. The 8288B is to show the Internal Revenue Service that you don't have any gain on the sale of that property because of the exclusion <coughs> of gain or for any other reason. And then you send it away and you tell the withholding agent, wait, I have an 8288B. Go ahead and withhold that 10% of the gross proceeds from the sale of my property, but now don't turn it over yet to the Internal Revenue Service. Just hold it and wait for a letter from the Internal Revenue Service telling you that you can give the money back to me. So the withholding agent, having received this 8288B, a copy of it saying, says, okay, I will wait and I will, I will wait for the IRS letter. And then they wait and they wait and they wait because the IRS is very busy. <laughs> and so sometimes they take 90 days, sometimes 120, and they don't guarantee how many days they take. But again, if you're going to try to get your money back faster than, ha than filing a tax return, especially if you sell the property in February, March, April, May, probably all the way up until at least September, you might consider still filling out the 8288B in order to get your money back faster. So finally, when the withholding agent gets the, money back, uh, gets the letter back from the Internal Revenue Service, that's when they can turn over back the money, um, give the money back to you, and then you go, finally got the money back, that's good. Um, but if they didn't, if, or if you sell your property, in my example, after September, there's no specific cutoff, but again, if the IRS takes three months to get back, you might as well sometimes just not worry about the 8288B and just file a tax return instead of filing the 8288B to get your money back. So what do you do? If you sell your, your property, say, October, November, December, the withholding agent will just turn your money over to the IRS, they will give you a tax form, and then you fill out the Form 1040-NR for that year, and typically the forms come out before February 1st, so you can start getting really ready to fill out that tax return. You fill out the tax return, and if you didn't have any gain from the sale of your principal residence because of the exclusion, then you show that on the tax return, and you'll also show the withholding. And most of the time, you'll get all the withholding back. If you don't have to actually, if you're not liable for any tax to the U.S. government, you'll just get all the withholding tax back when you, fill, when you file the Form 1040-NR. And typically that will take about six weeks to get the money back once you file the 1040-NR. Okay, how many people are willing here? Uh, I was really surprised. I gave a presentation at the 1818 Society, and I was absolutely surprised at how many people at least were attempted to be scammed by people that were fraudulently acting like the Internal Revenue Service. They would call their cell phones 
and this is a common technique. They call people, the, these scammers, call, uh, call people cell phones, and they say, this is the Internal Revenue Service. We're very angry at you. As a matter of fact, you haven't paid your rightful amount of taxes, and if you don't pay them now, we're going to send the sheriff to pick you up and throw you into jail. And they can be very intimidating, and they somehow are able to get some pieces of information, either through the internet or other ways, so it makes it seem like they know about you. So how many people here are willing to raise their hand to say you've received one of those telephone calls? Yes, we have people in the audience. So let me just say that the, on behalf of the Internal Revenue Service, <laughs> oh no, I cannot act, I'm not acting, by the way, for this recording, I'm not acting on behalf of the Internal Revenue Service. Um, the Internal Revenue Service always sends first paper notifications if you own, owe any tax liability to the government. They always send it by mail. Now, occasionally, once if there is a full audit, you may be able to get, you may get a call from the agent, but not after you've received many, many letters. They never just call you on the phone, and they never threaten you either. So if you get one of these calls, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's from a person trying to scam you. They usually say, you must immediately go to the bank and make, make a wire transfer to this particular account in order for us not to arrest you. Realize that never happens, and so do not get scammed. And if you do try to get, if, if you're tried to get scammed, somebody tries to scam you, call the <coughs> Treasury Inspector at that number to report it. <coughs> One other thing you should know about before we'll take questions. The other thing you should know about is what's called FATCA. The four, many, we have FERPTA, we have FATCA, we have all sorts of great uh, things to pronounce. FATCA is the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act. You see, in 2009, the U.S. government tried to um, impl implement, they passed a law, and it, the law did pass and it is being implemented, where worldwide financial institutions are supposed to look through their client base for any U.S. people or people they perceive might be U.S. people and report that either, report the income that that person has earned in that financial institution abroad either to the U.S. government or to, or to their government who will then report it to the Internal Revenue Service. So it used to be people would ask me, Dale, how will they ever find out? Well. FATCA is how they will find out. As a matter of fact, foreign governments decided that this was so interesting because they also have citizens living in their home country that may be putting financial assets abroad, that they're, they're, many of the European countries especially are all on board with this worldwide FATCA. And before you know it, we'll have computers throughout the world keeping track of everyone's income and reporting it to all the governments where they're located. So, what is the practical applications, especially to G4s? Well, if you have, if there's any indication from your foreign financial institution that you've given them that indicates that you might be a U.S. person, in other words, if you have a U.S. address or if you have a U.S. telephone number even, then you may be getting a call from your financial institution. And some people and just don't even get any calls. They just say, Look, we don't know what we don't want to know about your particular tax situation. All we know is you have a US address and we're not going to accept anyone with a US address. Has anybody had that from their foreign financial institutions? Wow, primarily all the people on this side of the room. Okay, so <laughs> um, yes. So the reason for that is this global fact that now these financial institutions abroad, they can accept US people's accounts. It just makes it, there's just more paperwork involved. And many of them, for their, because of their own internal policy, have just decided not to take anybody that's a U.S. citizen, green card holder, or other person who may look like a U.S. person. And you can argue till you're blue in the face, and just because you have a U.S. address or a U.S. telephone number, they're going to say, no, I'm sorry, we're not going to handle your account. That's unfortunate, but that's the way the world is. Okay, so now we can take questions. Um,